Hello everyone, this is David Cerns from Haley Marketing and welcome to today's Lunch with Haley event. Today we're going to be talking about uh, surviving the boom, six essential strategies for success in 2015. I thought this would be a really appropriate way to end what uh, hopefully for everyone on today's call has been an absolutely banner 2014. The staffing industry is certainly doing really well, whether you're in executive recruiting or temporary help uh, in any sector of the industry, you're probably having a really good year. And uh, right now, all signs are pointing, pointing to an even stronger 2015. So today, we're going to talk about a few things that uh, you can do next year to help your business ensure an even more successful 2015 than the 2014 you had this year. Uh, as a reminder, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you have questions, uh, feel free to use that question window, shoot them in. I'll do my best to answer them as we go. And uh, if you want to um, play along online, we're using the hashtag Lunch with Haley, and we've got a whole team of terrific folks here at Haley Marketing Group ready to help answer questions, share slides, follow up with any more detailed information that you might need. With that said, let's get started. All right, first and foremost, uh, things are great. We are in the middle of the biggest boom ever in the staffing industry. In fact, the ASA, the American Staffing Association's staffing index recently hit its highest value ever. We've fallen off a little bit from the peak, but we are still essentially at the highest level of employment for temporaries ever. Uh, I think the stats that I saw at the end of last month, it was 2.95 million workers uh, out there daily in temp jobs, which is absolutely terrific for all of us in the staffing industry. But of course, with all the good, there are challenges. And as I'm sure everybody knows all too well, it's getting harder to find talent. And so I believe this was uh, a career builder study that listed the 10 jobs that are currently being seen as the hardest to fill. Not too many surprises here. Um, a little heavily geared towards the manufacturing side of the world with technicians, skills, trades, engineers, laborers, uh, the production operators, machine operators. The only one that's not on this list that I was surprised by is I didn't see IT on this list. And I think uh, anybody who's on the call today in IT, you know that finding high quality technical professionals is exceptionally difficult and probably should be a top 10. But what this list says, if you look, it's across all areas. It's technical, it's skilled, it's unskilled, it's non-technical, it's management, it's admin, it's sales. Finding good people is tough. While we're not back to the sub 4% unemployment that we were in about 2007, 2008, we are at the point where the people who want to be in the workforce, who are actively looking for work, uh, it's getting exceptionally difficult to find good people. And that has huge implications on your 2015, because it doesn't matter how many job orders are out there. If you can't fill those job orders, you're not going to have a record year. So that stated, let's take a look at what we're going to cover today. Now, First and foremost, we're going to do a recap of a webinar we did last summer on recruiting optimization. We're going to spend just a few minutes, maybe five, maybe a little bit more, recapping some of the highlights of this webinar. If you want to see the webinar it's in, in its entirety, it is available via our website. So you'll be able to go to HaleyMarketing.com and go to our freebie section, check out the webinars, and listen on demand to that webinar. We're going to talk about referral programs. Nearly every staffing company in the world has a referral program, and we're going to talk about the things that you can do to make yours more effective. We're going to talk about the candidate experience. Um, those of you who compete in the Best of Staffing Talent Award, you know that it can be tough to get really good grades from your candidates, and the industry as a whole sadly does kind of an exceptionally poor job creating a great candidate experience. But for those staffing firms that do the things necessary to create an awesome experience, you will have a huge recruiting advantage in 2015. We're going to talk about the need for more job orders, which may sound really counterintuitive, but right now in this candidate star marketplace, you need more job orders. And we'll talk about why and how to get them. We're going to talk about strategies to dominate the web. That's both for from a recruiting perspective and from a business development perspective, what you can do to make sure that your firm is found more consistently online, positioned in the right way, and is regularly bringing more clients and candidates to your doors via the internet. 
And lastly, we're going to talk about a little bit on mastering time. Now, this is not a time management seminar. There are great speakers who can teach you that. But we're going to look at a few tools and ways to create some leverage so you can get more of your time focused on the things that you do best. All right, with that said, let's jump right into the first topic on the list, recruiting optimization. And again, this is a recap of a, a webinar some of you may have seen last August. Uh, for those who didn't, go to our website, take advantage of the full recording, but let's take a look now at some of the highlights. First thing in recruiting optimization is thinking about the job titles you're using. And are you using job titles that are the best at attracting talent? Actually, I want, to compl I want you to really completely rethink your overall strategy on job posts, on your website, on job boards, uh, when you're sharing them on social media. Because you are competing not just for that receptionist job you're trying to fill, or not just for that general laborer, but you're competing with everybody else who's trying to fill the same job. Whether they're in staffing or outside of staffing, you've got to get their attention and interest. And it starts with things like job titles. Forget the Me Too, boring, just descriptive job titles, and use different ways to describe the same job that are more compelling to your audience. And I'll show you an example in just a minute. When writing your post, you have to really focus first on what you can offer to the candidate. If a candidate has a choice of multiple job opportunities, you have to answer the question, why should they choose you? If you don't have a compelling answer to that, you're not going to get the candidate to apply or they're not going to accept your job opening. And as you all know, it's not always about pay. A lot of it's about opportunity for career advancement, opportunity for skill development, or simply how you treat the candidate that's different than what they're going to get from another organization. You want to differentiate your jobs in the language you use. If you look at real estate agents or travel agents, uh, they do a great job of differentiating their properties by using language that is going to effectively sell the homes and the destinations that they are attempting to market. And just the same way in staffing and recruiting, we have to think about how to effectively sell our client, not have the mindset of we have a list of requirements and we're trying to screen who, to who fits those requirements. No, we're trying to recruit as many qualified candidates we can as we can with every job post because even if they're not right for the candidate whose job we're placing, we can take that labor pool we've recruited and place them on other assignments. So let me t show you a real life experiment and this is one we did. We were recently hiring for a job title called a client service specialist. That's the actual title of the job that we use internally. We had, when we advertised this job on our website, on our social channels, and on job aggregators, we had a whopping total of five people apply for the job. Nobody got an interview. So we went back and we took the exact same description and we put it up on our website with two different job titles. One with marketing support specialist, because we know marketing is a keyword people search for, and the other with help desk slash customer service, because this client service specialist really is on the front lines providing a help desk kind of service, helping our clients to diagnose problems and learn how to use their job boards and learn how to use their, their uh, WordPress database software more efficiently. So that's the functional requirements of the job. And then the word marketing is more of a, of a title that we're using to attract people looking for higher level positions. Well, you can see what happened. Just changing the job title, when we used the word marketing, we went from five to 25 new applications, and Help Desk, uh, for better or worse, um, blew out our inbox with 125 job applications, but look at the next line. Only one candidate interviewed out of that list of 125, whereas five out of 25 with marketing support. So what happened here? Using different job titles got us not only different levels of quantity, but different levels of quality. In our case, quality really mattered, so the, uh, the finalist who did get hired came out of that middle stack. Um, but if you're thinking about your jobs and you're saying, you know what, I just need a large volume of candidates, you may try advertising that position with different titles that will appeal to the greatest audience. Because the more people who apply, the more that go into your database, the bigger the talent pool you have to turn around and skill market to local employers. The next one is to make sure your jobs are really on your website and being optimized for search engines as part of your website. Um, I've seen a very disturbing trend recently where there are companies in the job board business and in the ATS business, and I will say 
None of them are staffing industry vendors, but I've seen some of the HR vendors that are promoting things about job boards that are simply not true. Uh, we recently had a client who was promised that this mobile product they were going to buy got all the jobs optimized for mobile, got all the jobs optimized for SEO, and integrated with their staffing software. Well, I happen to know the executives at the software company pretty well, so I contacted them and I said, do you guys integrate with this product? And the answer was, we've never heard of them. So be really cautious when you're talking to third-party vendors to make sure that if they're taking your job data and putting it somewhere, it's really going to be on your site, on the domain of your company's website. So when somebody does a search in Google for a job, they're able to find your job on your site. You also want to make sure that the jobs can be optimized, optimized based on the URL of the job. The URL should contain your company's domain, the title of the job, the word jobs, and a geographic location, all in the URL. The page title should also contain that same information. So you want to make sure that you're including keywords, job title, the word jobs, and location in your posts on your website so the search engines can find every individual job on your site. You also, within your website, you want to make sure that jobs are really easy to find and really easy to search. And if your, your job board does not give you the ability to have RSS feeds of your job data, find one that does. You want to be able to use an RSS feed so that I can take things like hot jobs, which you see in the green box, or in the white box at the bottom, featured jobs, pull specific jobs out of your job board and feature them on other pages throughout your website so when a job seeker hits your home page there are the jobs when they go to the page for job seekers there are your jobs you also want to have the ability to have a job search widget so they can quickly do a search from any page in your website whether it's with a, a simple drop down like you see some examples here or just a, a search jobs button that can take them to the ability to search your jobs the idea is promote your jobs everywhere relevant throughout your website because you don't know how people are entering your site. Not everybody enters through your home page. A lot of people may enter through another job. They may enter through your blog. Uh, they may enter because they did a search and it takes them directly to some other sub page on your site. Make it easy to get to your jobs from anywhere. Make sure your job board and your website can maximize your distribution of your jobs. And distribution means to third-party job aggregators, places like Indeed, Simply Hired, Glassdoor, as well as social sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Google+. You can get a ton of free distribution of your jobs automatically just by sending feeds to these different sites. Um, this is self-promotion here. This is something our job board does, as do several of the ATS companies in the staffing industry provide you with the capability to push your jobs out to the free site. So you're getting them into more places that are going to show up higher in search results. Indeed, Simply Hired Glassdoor, they have huge domain authority, so lots of traffic comes to them from Google searches. So when somebody's searching your job, there's nothing better than having it show up on Simply Hired and Indeed and Glassdoor and your website so there's four different ways someone can get to you. You also can take the jobs and share them yourself on social media so that they're going out to Twitter, every single job. Or a recruiter in your firm has a feed of just the jobs that recruiter owns going to their updates on LinkedIn. You also want to make it easy so an individual post could be shared by a candidate or a recruiter on social media. So ideally, when someone gets into a specific job on your site, there are navigation buttons, as you see at the top of the, the uh, job post here, to share on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn or via email or on Google+. So a recruiter in your firm could do the sharing or a candidate who wants to share it with a friend could easily do it. And we'll talk more about how to get more candidates through sharing in just a minute. And 2015 is really going to be about experimenting because as it gets harder to get response from the traditional things you've been doing, you're going to want to test new ways to recruit. I know LinkedIn has probably contacted every single person on the call today about their LinkedIn recruiter product. And we've got some clients that swear by LinkedIn recruiter and other clients who don't find as much value. I strongly recommend talking to them, looking at the various product offerings they have, and then determining for the type of talent you want to find, would they be valuable? 
For hard to find talent, LinkedIn Recruiter can be very be beneficial because they will help put you in front of specific types of people. If you have talent that might be easier to find but you need to get it out to a much wider audience, ZipRecruiter has a brand new product coming out called ZipRecruiter Boost that will allow you to promote your job to their entire network via social distribution, uh, job aggregator distribution, and email distribution. And that's coming out from them, I think, in just a couple of months. They actually contacted us um, just a couple of weeks ago and asked us to, to integrate ZipRecruiter Boost into our tools, which we are looking to do. You also may want to test pay per action or pay per click advertising on Indeed and Simply Hired and Glassdoor. Set up a test budget with these organizations and try doing the PPC for your jobs. We've got some clients who swear by it, some who don't. The cost to do it um, based on data from Indeed can range from 25 cents to a buck and a half per click. And if you're doing a resume search, uh, Indeed will charge you a dollar per candidate that you contact. So you can look at some of these pay per models. So you're only paying for people who respond to your ads. The pay per click means you're paying for every single click someone makes. Pay for action, some of the boards are actually going to pay per candidate. Now they don't judge quality there, you've got to pay for every candidate you get, but you're only paying for the candidates you receive. One thing I don't want people to forget about is grassroots marketing being visible in your local community, whether you see the example in the bottom right corner here, the folks at PSG in Boston who do a lot of outdoor advertising. Uh, I know people who use uh, community and church bulletins and flyers, uh, local college campus recruiting, whether it's on campus or getting college students to be champions to help you promote your jobs. What you're trying to do is get as active in your local community as you can so your firm becomes more visible. Uh, it can be at events like job fairs or it can be even at social or civic community events. The more you are promoting your firm and your brand, the more you're making your place look like a great organization to work for, which again we're going to talk about in a little bit, the more that will help you to attract top talent to your organization. And before, we're going to move on now, speaking of attracting top talent to referral programs. Uh, somebody asked the question, uh, what is the primary target for LinkedIn Recruiter and Zip Recruiter? Uh, and, and if that is in terms of the primary type of candidate, they're going to vary. Uh, LinkedIn will tell you they can go after everybody because we've got 200 million profiles in LinkedIn. But it's going to be primarily for professional talent, um, particularly for harder to find skills, because they're going to be able to put you in front of people whose profiles match the demographics of the job you're trying to fill. If you need 100 general laborers for a job tomorrow, it's probably not going to be a great tool. ZipRecruiter, on the, on the other hand, is more about high volume, lots and lots of places to get your job out, and a massive database that they're going to put your job in front of. Uh, they will also promote that they are going to be very good for targeted high skill positions, but I would also argue they're going to be a better fit for higher volume kinds of, I need people tomorrow, so let's blast out to a large audience today kinds of jobs. All right, referral programs. Now, my completely unscientific statistic, 99% uh, of refer referral programs fail. Yeah, I made it up. Uh, but Intuitively, you probably know it's true that most staffing companies have referral programs. They get some traction. They get far less than we would like, yet they are the highest quality source of candidates is to get referrals from your current candidates or employees or even your clients. So we're going to talk about how to build a more effective referral program, and if I remember this correctly, in five steps. So step number one is to be a best place to work. I'm going to get into more detail on this in the next section we're going to go through, but think about it as if I want a temporary employee, if I want a candidate I place to refer other candidates to me, I better be a great place to work. I better be a great company because if I don't run a great company, no one is going to want to give me referrals. Step two, have awesome jobs. If you have a tremendous product to offer, the jobs you're selling, you're going to get more candidates. And it can be hard in staffing to have awesome jobs because a lot of times companies are coming to you with jobs they couldn't fill on their own or they're coming to you with lower quality, lower paying jobs that they want you to find candidates who are willing to work for minimum wage in horrible conditions. We can't eliminate those jobs and staffing firms 
part of our responsibility is to be able to go out and find talent for whatever types of positions our clients need. But you need to balance that with also having some great jobs. Top local employers, excellent paying jobs. What I would do is, I kind of, as it says on screen here, do whatever it takes. I would look at some of the, the top local employers in my community and strategically look to partner with them. Consider them like a supermarket with lost leaders. That I may not make the same profit I would make on, an, on a regular client, but I want to be able to use them as a recruiting partner. And in exchange for my being able to use them as a recruiting partner, I can now leverage their name in our recruitment marketing to attract more people. Now, I'm not going to be dishonest with the candidates and say and promise them jobs at a company I can't get them in, but if I have more jobs to offer, I can present the candidate with a range of options and when those jobs at the top company are filled, we can get them to want to work for some of the other employers we represent. And also remember, awesome jobs don't just mean top paying. The it can mean excellent advancement opportunities, it can mean appropriate training, uh, it can mean more temp to perm opportunities for people who are looking for full-time employment. The idea is you're trying to leverage on your website, in your sharing, those most desirable jobs to increase candidate flow to your website. Um, and someone asked a question I want to address right now. Doesn't, do you really want to use a client's name? Doesn't that give leads to our competitors? I'm going to be very blunt. I don't care if the competitors know who my clients are. You shouldn't either. If you're going to lose a client because your competitor knows the client's name, you don't have a very good relationship with that, with that client. And that client is probably already being called on by every one of your competitors today. So I am completely in favor of leveraging brand name clients, now brand name doesn't have to mean a big company, it can mean somebody in your community who's known as a top employer, leveraging that if it will attract more candidates to fill more jobs. I know some of you will totally disagree with me about this, but I've seen more success come from sharing client names than I've seen from protecting them. Some of our most successful clients in IT regularly advertise who their clients are because that's what attracts top IT professionals is seeing the types of organizations where they're going to go get to work. Step three is to deconstruct your candidate communication process. And what do I mean by deconstruct? I mean literally map out everything you do in communicating with candidates. Look at every single touch point from the time they first hear about you until after you've placed them on assignment and you're following up. So you want to look at every one of those touch points and say where in the process can I find opportunities to ask for referrals. Where on my website can I do it? I want to do it after they apply for a job online or submit their resume. I want to do it at the end of a blog post. I want to do it at the end of our paper application. I want to do it during the interview, as long as I know I like the candidate. If it's a candidate I'm going to reject, I might not want to ask for referrals. I want to do it at the end of their first assignment, because that's when they're happiest with you. I want to do it right after they receive their first paycheck. I want to do it inside a paycheck stuffer if you're still using paper paychecks. And I want to systematically send out hot job email alerts to my, my current candidates and my alumni to ask them for referrals. If you map out every single touch point, not everyone's going to be appropriate to ask for a referral, but you can identify all the ones that are appropriate to ask for referrals. And you're asking multiple times and you're asking in different ways to get people to give referrals. I mean, people aren't going to refer people to you all the time just because you ask for a referral, they're going to refer when they know someone looking for work, when they like you as an employer, and when they see a job that they think is a good fit for someone they know. That's why you have to keep telling them about the referral opportunities over and over again. Step number four is to build a referral network and to nurture it. So a referral network can consist of all of your current candidates, people who have come to your website. Make sure they can opt in for some sort of job alert notification. That can include alumni, people you've placed in the past that you want to stay in touch with. That can include people who are in your local community or in the industry you serve who could be referral sources for candidates. Uh, maybe it's the directors of the local career planning office at, at local colleges and universities. Maybe it's the Department of Labor. Maybe it's people who are teachers at certain trade schools or technical schools in your area. 
Even your clients and internal employees can be included in your referral network. And the idea to nurturing it is you're not just always asking for referrals, but you want to be someone who cares about your network by sharing interesting, relevant, useful tips and ideas with your network, whether it's via email, via social, via telephone calls, via direct mail. You're nurturing relationships so that from time to time you can ask people, hey, who do you know that might be a fit for these jobs that we're trying to fill? But it's not only about blasting out hot jobs and asking for referrals because people get tired of that really quickly and they'll opt out of your list. They have to see you as someone that cares about them. You show you care about them, they're more likely to care about you. And promoting your hot jobs all the time, everywhere, on your website. We saw some examples earlier of promoting jobs throughout the website. In emails, so you can have a hot job alert email that you send out as often as weekly, uh, or candidates can opt in to get daily updates on jobs they're specifically interested in. If you do a monthly candidate-focused newsletter or job seeker-focused newsletter, make sure you're featuring hot jobs in those. If you have an alumni newsletter, Talk about job openings and remind people we're always looking for good referrals in your alumni newsletter. To all of your candidates, all of your referral sources, and occasionally I mentioned to your clients. We had a situation with a client several years back where the client had a last minute job order for 20 call center employees and they were struggling to fill it. So they said, you know what, a lot of our clients recruit for their call centers. They get candidates they can't place. They may have people that they'd love to help find a home. So they contacted their clients and said, hey, we've got these, this tremendous opportunity. If there's anybody that you know that you'd love to help get a job, here are the details. They filled 20 positions in an afternoon just coming from client referrals. Your clients want to be on your side. They want to see you as part of the team, and your existing clients would love it if you can leverage your network to help them fill jobs faster. Even the network includes other local employers. The other places we mentioned making sure the jobs get out to job aggregators and making sure they get out to social sites and wherever you're posting your jobs have somewhere in the post where you're encouraging referrals because people who see your job post they may not be looking but they may know someone who is. In fact it's probably more likely that they know someone than they are directly looking. Oh and I did lie, I said five steps but there's a sixth. Make it easy to tell others. So we saw an example before of social sharing on the job board. You just want to make sure that anywhere someone comes in contact to your jobs, whether it's in your job board, maybe you create a blog post about your jobs, they can easily share that with friends via social media, via email, so it's really simple for them to help spread the word, even simple for your internal staff to spread the word about the positions you're trying to fill. And before we wrap up and for the section on referrals, I want to talk about referral incentives. Um, most of them in the staffing industry stink. The biggest motivator to people is not cash, yet the most common incentive used in the staffing industry are cash referrals and they're usually dollar amounts that are so low they're not motivating at all. You have to think about how can I make a reward more meaningful to the candidate. Now it has to be fit within the constraints of what are you really strictly willing to pay for a qualified candidate. So if it's a general laborer, I'm not going to pay $1,000 for a referral incentive or something equivalent to $1,000. But maybe if it's for a direct hire for a $100,000 a year job, I would. So a couple of examples, some of our clients, uh, here's a client of ours that recruits physicians. So when you go to their website, they have a fly out at the bottom of the page, refer a friend and earn a free iPad. Now they've been running this promotion for years. My guess is it doesn't get quite the same traction as when they first put it up because when they first put it up, the iPad, I think, 2 was a newer generation technology. People were excited about it. The idea to get one for a referral was more motivating than the $500 it cost to purchase one. Uh, another client of ours had is running a really cool contest that uh, get free rent and a job. You go to their website, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can get your rent paid just by going to work for them and for an entire year they are paying people's rent who go to work through their organization. And One of the things that's interesting about this one is not everybody's going to get free rent. It's a contest and there have been some psychological studies that demonstrate 
people are more willing to participate in something when there's a small chance of a big prize than even when there's a guaranteed chance of a small prize. It's the big sell that gets their attention, and that's why I love this promotion. Um, free rent is a big sell, and even though what this organization is really paying out is cash, they didn't talk about it as cash. They translated it into value for the candidate, rent. That's a biggie. So very clever. Congratulations, ABR. Brilliant marketing idea. Uh, the idea, though, of using non-cash, otherwise adding high-value incentives to encourage referrals and, in this case, to encourage employee retention. All right, we're going to talk about candidate experience next, but a couple of questions have come in that I want to address. They were on that last section. So um, one question asked, as a solo operator, how do I become a best place to work? Um, you're really not going to be a best place to work. You're going to be a best recruiter to work with. And you really want to get that feedback from your candidates that you've helped and placed. Get them to do reviews for you on Yelp and Glassdoor um, of you as a recruiter. Now, Glassdoor might be hard because they're reviewing employers, but they can, you could get a Yelp review for you as a recruiter. You can get a Google review for you as an employer. Fill your website with testimonials, video testimonials, text-based testimonials, people talking about how you do what other recruiters do not to help people find the right job. And so you want to be the best recruiter for the specific types of people that you place. Um, there are some concerns about my suggestion to use the client's name in your recruitment marketing. You know, what happens if they go directly to the organization to apply? That can happen. You may lose candidates who go around you, and if the client has the same job order you have, that is a risk. Maybe you'd say, hey, I don't want to take that risk. But if my client was Google, and I can put that on my website, and I'm going to generate 10 times the amount of candidate inflow by using Google in my Ads, you bet I'm going to do it, even if I risk some of them going directly and maybe losing that one job order. Remember, we're talking about a marketplace in which there are more job orders than candidates, so I want to do whatever I can to get more candidates that I can place. Could I potentially lose some who would go directly? Yes. Um, another question was, won't you make your current worker want to jump ship for another offer when you're promoting offers to them and maybe it's better than where they work today? It's going to happen. You're exactly right. Your candidates are going to say, hey, this job's paying more than what I'm making right now. Well, what you want to do is you want to talk to that candidate. You want to, when, they, when they apply, you want them to say, look, we, when you finish this current assignment, let's talk about your skills. Let's see what we can do next. If they're qualified for that other job opening you have available, then you're going to have to talk to them about how similar opportunities will be open when they finish the assignment. Uh, if it's a very long-term assignment they hate, well, maybe you want to do talk about, let's look at maybe making a transition. Then you have to talk to your client about this person who was going to leave, and what can we do to make sure that it's not an issue. Be proactive in working with both the client and the candidate, because you want to create a great experience for both. All right, and speaking of experience, sorry for that break, need a little water. Um, let's talk about how to make that candidate experience better because if the candidate experience isn't exceptional and your competitor's experience is, guess where your candidates are going to go? So why should you become a best place to work? Why does it make sense to participate in the best of staffing talent or to be the best employer in your local marketplace or best employer in a specific industry? And it's really simple. Candidates have choices. You have choices. If you could go to work for company A or company B, company A is a good company, company B is an exceptional company, where do you want to apply? If you're not the best alternative for a job candidate in your marketplace, for a temporary worker in your marketplace, why would they want to work for you? Why should they work for you? If you have a quote-unquote inferior product because you're not offering as high quality of experience as the competition is, it's expensive. You're going to have to spend more money on recruiting because you're going to have a harder time attracting people, and it's demotivating to your recruiters because they're going to have to work harder to get candidates than they would if they worked for the competition. You'll also have more turnover in your organization. So focusing on your culture and the experience you deliver to the candidates pays for itself many times over in terms of recruiting, in terms of retention, and in terms of lowering your costs of recruiting. It will allow you to attract more people faster, and of course that means you can deliver better service to your clients because 
you're going to be able to attract talent faster and attract higher caliber talent. You'll fill more of their job orders. So being a best place to work isn't just a nice banner to add to your website. If you're in staffing, it is imperative that you are one of the top employers for the types of people you place in your local market. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you analyze the best places to work competition, uh, go Google it when we're done with today's webinar and take a look at the common traits of the winners. Uh, there's a or Google uh, the 20 best places to work in 2015. You'll see a picture here that shows Google at number one. It shows some data from Glassdoor. They went through the top 20 employers in the United States and why they're the best place to work. Learn from that list. But there were five things that I learned in doing this research. Number one, it's a positive culture. Positive meaning upbeat, optimistic, open, direct, supportive, team focused. Uh, I've been in recruiting and staffing firms where for the recruiters it's every man or woman for himself. And it creates almost a toxic environment as people compete for candidates and job orders uh, and they don't want to be part of a team or collaborative. I've seen environments where managers are micromanaging and but the, you know they've got almost a closed door policy. They don't want people coming to interrupt them. Uh, you want to have an open, positive, supportive environment where it's a great place to work, but that extends beyond your internal employees. That includes your temporary workforce and making them feel like they're truly a part of your organization, that you are communicating with their, them regularly, that you're recognizing them for their hard work and the, the good work that they do for your clients, that you're remembering them on important events like their birthdays and service anniversaries. You also, the second thing is to have be an organization with a strong purpose. Why do you exist? Organizations with a strong purpose attract more people. So Google's mission is to organize all the information in the world. If you have a strong, clear purpose for your business, it's easier for people to get excited about working for you because that purpose isn't just about, hey, let's make the owners more money. That purpose has to be about, let's do some good in the world. And every individual in your organization has to understand how they're part of delivering that good. Again, that also can extend to your candidates and the good that they are delivering for your clients. And I rarely see this in staffing where staffing organizations are communicating with their candidates about the purpose of the organization and how their role as a temporary employee is help driving some meaningful benefit in their local community. You have to provide people with challenge and opportunity. Uh, people want meaningful work. So if somebody is willing to take that less than meaningful job opportunity this time, well, try to reward them with something that's better the next time. Be proactive about helping people to learn and advance their careers and provide more opportunity for learning through your website, through webinars, through uh, sessions you conduct in your offices so that they see you as committed to helping them be as successful as they can be, and them being both your internal employees and your field employees. The fourth point is about communication and clarity, making sure you set clear expectations and be awesome at communicating. You want to make candidates feel like they're truly part of your team, that they know what you expect. They know how to interact with your clients. They know that you want referrals. They know that you want them to tell you when they have issues or concerns uh, because you want to show that you care about them. You want to show that you understand what they're supposed to do and they know what you expect and that you're listening to their concerns and interests. And lastly, you know, provide appropriate reward and recognition. Uh, pay attention to the results people are delivering and reward your top performers. Now, it can be cash rewards, uh, an assignment completion bonus, uh, a reward for getting positive feedback from a client. Or it can be as simple as praise, sending an email out, uh, sending a card out, saying thank you to someone who does a great job, ha carries a lot of weight because, again, most companies aren't doing this with their candidates. And if you can do it with yours, you will differentiate your firm from everybody else. And, again, candidates who have a great experience are going to want to refer more candidates to you. Now, you also want to be able to show off your culture, and that can be harder because you're working with a distributed workforce. So how do you do that? Well, number one is awards. Participating in best of staffing, participating in best places to work is one way to get a badge for your website to show off. We are truly a great place for people to work in this community. Using your marketing communications, 
your outbound to really demonstrate what you're doing for people. So if you have that candidate newsletter, that alumni newsletter, the newsletter to employee referral sources, talk about the things that you do to treat your people better than the competition. Talk about the special programs you have. Share success stories. Celebrate your people. And also do that in your client communications because a lot of HR managers, they want to see that you're an organization that really cares about treating people well because they know that results in higher quality talent, greater retention, and for them, a lower cost of service and fewer headaches dealing with a great employer. Again, this is another opportunity. Be really active in your local community, whether it's civic, social, or philanthropic causes. Get your team involved. Invite your temps to get involved so that you are showing up with a big presence at these events. Hand everybody t-shirts from your company when you go to the event. So like, wow, look at all the people here from ABC Staffing. What a great organization that they're out doing Habitat for Humanity. They're out doing this fundraiser. They are really active in the community. I want to learn more about that organization. Do PR regularly in your local community. Share success stories about how you are putting people to work, how about you are making a difference for local employers, how you are solving problems that help make the business community and individuals more successful because news media is always looking for good news stories. And in staffing, we have hundreds of good news stories every month. All we got to do is write them up and share them. Share them on your website. Share them by physically sending press releases out to people. And lastly, look at social reviews. Social reviews are critical for the staffing industry, and for most of the industry, there's more negative than positive. You want great reviews on Yelp, on Google Reviews, on Glassdoor. You want your happy candidates, your happy clients to be posting reviews, telling the world about how awesome an organization you are to work for. If you are not getting those today, uh, talk to us. We actually, this is a new service from Haley Marketing to help people build social reviews. It is powerful and the nice thing is it can be done in a matter of weeks if you put a focus on it. All right, one of my contrarian points of view. When you're short on candidates, get more job orders. You, you can never have enough job orders. And this was a lesson my dad taught me years and years and years ago. Because he said, in a candidate-starved market, you need to place every candidate. Anybody you have that's qualified for a job in your database and you don't put to work, the competition is going to put them to work. So you need to make sure that you have that um, square hole for the square peg and the round hole for the round peg. You need more job orders, not fewer, so that everybody that would be a good representative of your firm that walks in your doors you have a way to get them placed. Now, you may not have an immediate opportunity, so you have to be very proactive about marketing top talent. Show them how you're going to help skill market them in ways the competition is not. Do it through your website, do it through emails, do it through telephone calls, but you want to skill market great people more effectively, more thoroughly than the competition is doing. You want to make sure you're redeploying your temporary employees before they come off of assignments. And the reason you want to redeploy them is if they're idle, somebody else is going to put them to work in this economy. They're not going to be there the next time you need them. Make sure you give your current clients the first shot in an extension. Make, get your recruiters much more aggressive about making follow-up calls to figure out when assignments are really going to end and giving the client the first shot in an extension. If you show a lack of interest in your talent, if you don't replace them before the assignment ends, you're going to lose them to the competition, and then you're going to have to spend more on recruiting the next time you need someone with similar skills. This is also a time to do more marketing, not less. You want to get more aggressive about getting out to more employers to get those job orders. Maybe to find a wider variety of clients so that when you have some of the candidates with different skill sets that were harder to place, you've got more places to put them. Or when you get those really hard to find can candidates and your current client roster doesn't need them, you again have more places to get them placed. This is a great time to be, go to every local employer and really focus on becoming a backup supplier because you know their current supplier that they love is going to have more job openings that they don't fill. And if you can fill the job opening when they competitor can't, again, now you've got a new client, you've expanded your client roster, and you've got more opportunity going forward. Also, doing more marketing and building a wider client base makes you less dependent on each individual client 
which means in the event of the inevitable downturn, which will happen at some point, you'll have less risk to your business because you'll have a wider client base. This is also a great time to go after the competition. Uh, go after their A accounts aggressively because they're going to have difficulty providing the same level of service they did a year ago. Go to their websites and look at all the jobs that they have available and really look at what jobs are open. I'd make a little tally sheet by type. You know, how many in light industrial jobs and in what categories? How many accounting? How many admin? How many IT? Look at what they have open because where they're having trouble filling jobs, then look at where you can recruit. Then go after the places you know that they are doing business because you can beat them with your recruiting skills. When selling, ask your prospects about the frustrations they're experiencing with jobs that are either underfilled or open because you know it's likely to be happening and that frustration may open the door to giving you a shot at that business where normally they just tell you I'm happy with the current employer, excuse me, the current staffing firm. You also need to focus on your value in this market, both to your existing clients and to prospects. Part of the reason that there's more hiring going on is your clients are busier. So more than ever, they need the value of the fact that you can help save them time. You can help them fill job openings faster. So by filling job openings faster, it makes them increase their profitability. It makes, takes the stress off of their current workforce. You can improve their access to talent, giving them faster access to a wider talent pool. And if you're doing direct recruiting, you can go after people that they cannot get on their own. You can reduce the high cost of unfilled and underfilled jobs. When you have a job opening that is vacant, there is a big cost to the organization because somehow that work has to get done, which could be stressing others, leading to quality problems, leading to morale problems, leading to turnover problems, or even worse, the work's not getting done. And now that's leading to customer service problems or missed revenue opportunities. You can provide the talent they need to capitalize on those opportunities by better filling the job openings they have and making sure that every seat is filled. Uh, and then you can allow your clients to focus on their most important tasks. Sorry, not sure why they got split into two bullets. but. Part of the value of staffing has always been helping the client to be more focused on their core job activities. In a marketplace where the client is busier and more stressed than ever, this value becomes even more important. So when selling your services, it's really going to be about the economic value you are delivering in a market where people are really busy and good candidates are harder to find. Use these points as ways to connect with prospects to generate interest and make them want to do business with your firm. Next up, let's dominate the web. Now, a lot of the information here has been covered in other Lunch with Haley webinars, so I'm going to touch on a lot of points, but again, if you see something and say, I'd like more information on it, go to HaleyMarketing.com, click on that freebies tab, go to the webinars, and you will find webinars on almost every topic that you're about to see. First and foremost, create a killer staffing website. A great website is a magnet for people in your marketplace. A great website helps to, you to be found online, helps to differentiate you, helps to show people why you're not like everybody else. It's the first place every candidate's going to go, and your website has to not look just like every competitor in town. If you're the same old temp staffing, guess what? Candidates aren't going to want to come to you. Employers really aren't going to have an incentive to want to work with you. So differentiate yourself through the design, content, and functionality of your website. Be a master of Google, both in terms of PPC, pay-per-click, paid advertising, and search engine optimization, the content on your website, so that you show up in terms of more searches, your clients are doing. Now, we just had a, our annual holiday party here at Haley Marketing Group, and it's an all-day event. And our uh, SEO and social media team did an absolutely awesome presentation. One of the things they looked at is they did a comparison of inbound links between our firm and one of our competitors. And what they showed is we had 561,000 inbound links to our website. The competitor had 6,000. Our team is working to make our website, great. Build a killer website and master Google in terms of 
search engine optimization by lots of great content and lots of inbound links. They also are doing pay-per-click advertising to drive more people searching for specific types of keywords back to our website. You want to do the exact same things in your website. Dominate pay-per-click, dominate search engine marketing, so whenever somebody's online, they're finding you. And in terms of your local market, you want to look at things like on-page optimization, how you're optimizing the content on every page, the physical content on your website, that you're regularly adding new content and optimizing that content for search engines, that you're building those inbound links, that you've went out and grabbed your Google Plus page so that Google knows who you are and where you are, that you're building reviews and that you're very active on social media to build relevance. And again, last month's Lunch with Haley was on SEO and social relevance, so if you want to know about this specific slide in a lot of detail, please check out our website and watch last month's webinar, some awesome information on how to dominate local search. You can also use pay-per-click very intelligently. I mentioned Google where you're buying ads based on searches people are running because you're trying to show up highly for search results around specific keywords, but you can also look at LinkedIn and Facebook to buy advertising to sponsor information targeting specific types of people on LinkedIn or on Facebook targeting specific demographics so I can go after certain people based on their interests, their personal demographics. You can even upload an email list of all the old candidates that you've worked with in the past and only advertise to your alumni network to try to drive them back to you to get reactivations and referrals. And this is another one. If you want to know more about PPC, we've got an hour on this on the webinar, excuse me, on our website as well. So I mentioned a couple of strategies for PPC. Let me just recap them. The Google AdWords is when you are advertising around searches people are doing. So you pay for an auction to bid on words people type into a search engine so that your ad pops up when those, that search is run. Second type of Google advertising is remarketing, where you are showing your ads when somebody surfs the internet, but you're only showing your ads to people who have already visited your website. So as they surf around the internet, your ads continue to follow them. That's designed to help you stay top of mind. And then on Facebook and LinkedIn, you can do sponsored stories and pay-per-click ads targeting people with much more specific demographics. Uh, Facebook can be very good for recruiting. LinkedIn tends to be more business development or recruiting of higher level people. LinkedIn's a lot more expensive, so I, if I was recruiting general laborers, I wouldn't look at LinkedIn. But if I'm recruiting a high level, hard to find IT people, I would definitely look at LinkedIn PPC as well as the LinkedIn recruiter product. And the picture you see on screen is an interesting example of remarketing. There's a video on YouTube that I was watching, and as I'm watching it, the video was from a staffing company. As I'm watching it, an ad popped up for another staffing company because that staffing company, Armada, was doing Google remarketing and I had been to their website. Now that is an example of how you can make your ads show up on other websites. Also if you're using YouTube and we told this company with the video how to do this, you can make sure nobody else's ads pop up on top of your videos. In terms of social relevance, think about social media as your new cold call. It's a way to connect with people directly, then, and your salespeople should be spending time every day, just like they're spending time picking up the phone, reaching out to clients, reaching out to candidates to build your personal network, doing very targeted searches, and then one-to-one -one reaching out to people to build the network of contact, contacts. I would allow, I used to say 15 to 30 minutes, I would probably allow 30 minutes to an hour a day of social networking with the purpose of being another form of cold calling. And when you're doing it, please, 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 don't just reach out with a sales pitch, but think about why does the person you're reaching out to want to connect to you as a recruiter, as a staffing sales professional, as a staffing business owner. Give them a strong reason to connect with you, make the connection, nurture the relationship, then you can tell them about what you do. And lastly, think about being everywhere on the web. Social media through status updates, group sharing, actually writing blog posts directly on LinkedIn. Um, you know, those of you who may follow me on LinkedIn, I've been taking some of the blogs that I, I'm writing and instead of putting them on our website first, I've been putting them on LinkedIn first and generating tremendous traffic. Um, I did one specifically uh, that, that said, Dear Sales Rep, uh, please stop. And it was about sales reps who send out sales blasts on LinkedIn and how annoying they are. 
Well, I reached over 1,200 people, most of whom I didn't know, by sharing that through a LinkedIn post, then take that same content and add it to our own company blog afterwards. Uh, YouTube, having a YouTube channel. YouTube is the second most searched search engine in the world. So creating videos, whether they're live actors or they're simple animations, creating videos to tell stories, case studies, promote your services, educate people about staffing, have a channel so that you're dominating YouTube in your market. And also thinking about direct messaging on social media, one-to-one -one messaging, just like you're picking up the phone. Then you want to be blogging on your own website and the websites of local and industry leaders so that you're sharing content, you're a guest blogger for others. And also, don't forget all of your offline marketing. Part of dominating the web is driving people to your website. And sometimes the best drivers of traffic are things that you're doing offline. We saw an example earlier of PSG and their taxi toppers and mass transit ads. They do a lot of offline marketing in the Boston area to drive candidates to their website and to their jobs and their offline is one of their best recruiting tactics. All right, last section. And I promise this was not an overview of time management, but it is about leveraging time because really time is your most important asset and you're going to be short on time all next year. I'm sure you're short in time every day now. We have to think about how can I use tools to help create more leverage to the hours we have to invest in each day. So in terms of marketing and recruiting, uh, email remains your best one-to-many tool. It's the fastest, it's still the most cost-effective way to market, and it generates the highest return on investment. And I know we all get too many emails in our inbox every day. Even with the fact that we get too many emails, it's still the most effective, most cost-effective, fastest response way to market, particularly if you marry email to the telephone and to direct mail, so it's multi-disciplined approach to marketing. Emails can be just text messages. They can be graphics, like you see the example on the screen here. They can be newsletters. They can be staffing promotions. They can be simple things like holiday cards and, and reasons to keep in touch and nurture relationships. They can also be direct promotions, hot jobs, top candidates, and one-to-one -one relationship building. The idea is you're creating a great email, you're sending it out to a list, you have a regular process for doing it to help you nurture relationships, stay top of mind without really tying up any of your sales and recruiting time. You can also look at marketing automation, and marketing automation is a way to have a CRM system, customer relationship management system, that does more than just track contacts and meetings and to-dos. Marketing automation actually can track activity going on with your website, people filling out forms on landing pages, uh, people who are completing certain steps on your website or visiting certain pages, and then what you do is you set up a sequence of events, as you see here on day one, on day eight, on day 15, what do you do, and then you can have a specific actions that can be send an email or add a tag to the contact or email the salesperson, notify the salesperson that certain actions have been taken with this contact. Automation allows you to leverage your time by automating the follow-up and automating the trigger points for your salespeople when they need to get on the phone. It's a great way to make sure you know who's visiting your website, what they're doing, and how often they're coming back uh, to set up scoring in your automation that at certain levels of activity tells your salespeople, hey guys, it's time to get on the phone. Social sharing, I've talked about it a couple times, the importance of social sharing, um, and I also mentioned you know, sharing an, a blog post on LinkedIn. Well, here's that Dear Sales Rep Stop It article, which had 1,180 views at the time uh, I made this slide, 108 likes and 28 comments. We don't get that much feedback on our blog, so we're getting a ton of interaction via social sharing. So I wrote the post, that's me, I'm the you, shared it with my network, they're sharing it with their network, and they're sharing it with my third level network that I don't know. Uh, I really got a kick out of one of the posts because it, the response, one of the comments was addressed to somebody that wasn't my name because somebody in that second level network had shared my article, and the third level network was responding to the second level network. It really boosted our visibility, drove a lot of traffic back to our profile on LinkedIn, and then on LinkedIn, we drive people back to our website. You can do the same thing to leverage your time. And this is a lesson that should be so obvious, I shouldn't have to put it as a slide, but I see staffing companies do this all the time. Don't forget you're there in the staffing business. Get help for yourself. Bring in temps, whether it's for sales support, 
whether it's for assisting your recruiters or with sourcing activities, maybe it's cleaning up your database or outsourcing portions of your back office, take advantage of the business that you're in. Get those helpers that you need. Santa has helpers. You need helpers. Get the helpers that you need to get more done and free your core people to do what they do best. And lastly, yeah, we're here too. If we can be of any help in 2015 to help you be more effective, creating a killer website, creating that content, optimizing your website, using PPC, creating email marketing, doing the social sharing, reputation management, or anything else related to marketing your business, improving your recruiting, and helping you have a great 2015, we would absolutely love to help. All right, well that brings us to the end. So I'm going to stay in line. We are right at an hour. I'm not quite sure how I managed to tie that to exactly one hour, but uh, that was just luck of the draw. But I have had a lot of questions. So I will stay on the line and continue to answer questions for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So fee please feel free to use that question window, and I'll do my best to, to touch everything I can. If we run out of time, we'll send emails back to everybody with responses. All right. So first up, would you suggest using PPC or AdWords for positions or keywords that are ranking low in regards to my company? Um, well, it's the, kind of a confusing question because AdWords are part of PPC and, and AdWords is Google AdWords where you're looking to rank higher for areas where your site is not ranking. I would most definitely do two things. Number one, uh, you want to do a little bit of analysis to see are those areas where you're ranking lowly things that people are really searching for. So is it worthwhile to try to optimize your site around those keywords. And then number two, if it's not a competitive keyword, then I would test the PPC with a low bid. If it's a very competitive keyword and we're ranking lowly, then I, again, probably would do the PPC, but I'd bid higher. So you want to set your bidding strategy based on how competitive the keywords are. You also want to be using, thinking about the best ways to target those keywords. If it's, if it's just searches people are doing, okay, Google advertising is probably going to be the best way to do it. If it's an audience like IT managers, well then AdWords is the wrong way to go about it. Then maybe I want to use something like the LinkedIn or, or Facebook PPC where I can target people based on their interests. Next question, would you share a blog on LinkedIn first to grab attention from people you don't know as opposed to first publishing it on your website? What if I'm trying to direct everyone to our website? A couple of things. Um, we're experimenting with the LinkedIn blogs right now. And my recommendation is to try LinkedIn first and then to do it on your blog. Test it out because you're going to get new distribution on LinkedIn to people you don't know. But in the blog post itself, you have complete control over graphics, hyperlinks. So you can put calls to action in that blog that drive people back to your website. Maybe the blog itself is a lead into other content on your website. So use your blog on LinkedIn as a tool to attract eyeballs. And then once you have those eyeballs, then how do I convert them to the next step, getting them back to our website by structuring the blog post on LinkedIn. Then you take the same blog post, then put it up on your company website, but now you don't need the things to drive people back to your website. Maybe that comes out of your blog post, and you replace it with a different kind of call to action, getting people to take a specific action that would further them down the sales funnel, get them closer to the money, closer to applying for a job, or requesting information about your services. Uh, someone says, going back to the creative job titles, what would you do when an employee wants the, ti the title in the ad but the employer is not comfortable with that title? Y you have to go with, with your client. If the client absolutely says, I will not allow you to use that title, I don't want you doing it, don't annoy the client. However, I would have a consultative call with the client saying, I want to advertise this job and this is the title that I want to use and here's why. Now, if you're not using the client's name because the client doesn't let you, if the job is just your job on your website, you have complete control over that title. And even if you're recruiting for company ABC, if you're not ident identifying company ABC, I see no reason that the client has control over that job title. Uh, it's your job, and that recruitment post that you're doing may not only be for their one job. It may be for multiple jobs you're recruiting for. So you definitely should do the things that will generate the most response. Next question, how do you know what to put in a title? Do you have suggestions or is it trial and error? That's a great question. Um, there is not one right answer and 
first thing I try to do is think about and just brainstorm, well, what are common ways people might think about this job? So let's say the job is an administrative assistant, all right, it's admin assistant, but it could also be secretary, receptionist, it could also be administrative support. Just brainstorm as many different ways as you can with your team for different job titles you commonly recruit for, and then think about experimenting. One of our clients, I showed you an example of their site who recruits physicians, they'll actually post the same job with multiple different titles to see what draws the most response in terms of quantity and quality. So you can do the exact same thing. As long as you have the ability to put the job on your own website, and you don't have to pay for every job that you put up there, then you want to put the jobs up there with different titles, see what works, keep tabs on the results, and repeat what works effectively. Okay, well we have reached the, uh, I think that's the end of the questions. If I missed anybody, I apologize, but feel, feel free, email me directly if you have questions, more than happy to answer. If you have questions about specific marketing ideas or how to implement this presentation in your business, guys, don't be shy. Uh, call us, email me, and we'll be more than happy to help answer those questions. And, um, Hard to believe, but our next Lunch with Haley is going to be in 2015 after the new year. We are going to be doing one on strategies for blogging and lead generation, showing you some of the newest, latest, and greatest ways people are using their blogs to drive traffic, to generate more sales leads, and to recruit candidates through their blogging efforts. And for me and everybody at Haley Marketing Group, I want to wish you all very happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and whatever you like to celebrate, and look forward to seeing you at the next Lunch with Haley in the new year.